So we finished our last class um, looking at the second broad point about the fighting of the French and Indian War, namely that, that England got crushed in the early phases of this war. I was pointing out a big part of the reason why the English got crushed was because they seemed really incapable of adapting to the fighting style that was being employed in North America. And we looked at one example of this in some detail. We looked at Edward Bulldog Braddock down here who attempted to march out to Fort Duquesne, the dominant French, French fort in Western Pennsylvania, and conquer it. And Braddock would march out there with his thousands of men. You can see that in this picture here and begin fighting this battle. The battle today is called the Battle of Monongahela River. But then the French and Indians he was fighting against would adopt this guerrilla warfare strategy. Today, we call that asymmetrical warfare. Back then, it wasn't called guerrilla warfare. It was called Indian fighting. But the the French are able to adapt to this style of fighting, as you can see in this picture. Braddock and the English regulars are not, and they're going to get routed in this battle. You can see Braddock is being killed here, and then we looked at this picture. Um, George Washington has successfully pulled Braddock off the field, but Braddock will die shortly afterwards, and the English are routed in this battle. But a big part of the reason why the English are losing so badly in the first three years of this war has to do with the fact that they were, at least in North America, unable to adapt to the conditions of fighting in North America. America, which were considerably different from the conditions of fighting over in Europe. A second example of the British getting beaten badly in this early phase of the war is at a, a, a kind of controversial episode called the Fort William Henry Massacre. I'll bring up the picture of the Fort William Henry Massacre that I want to talk about right now. I'll give you a brief overview of it, and then I'll tell you why it's important. So in the Fort William Henry Massacre, a group of French soldiers marched out to an English fort on Lake George. The name of the fort, of course, was Fort William Henry. And the French soldiers had superior numbers and firepower, and they laid siege to the fort. And ultimately, the fort wasn't going to be able to withstand the siege that the combined French and Indian army um, were throwing at it. So the French French commander, this is actually him in this picture, his name is the Marquis de Montcalm, met with the English commander and offered him very generous terms of surrender. You, all of your men can leave. You get to keep your sword and your flag. I won't even take that from you. All you have to do is abandon the fort and the cannon at the fort, march back to Albany and promise that the people that were fighting here will not fight again in the war. Very generous terms. And the British commander, I believe his name is Colonel Monroe, accepted these generous terms and he was allowed to march freely from Fort William Henry to Albany. As he was leaving the fort and getting deeper into the woods of upstate New York, he was attacked by mostly Huron Indians um, who had been allied with the French. Now, when the French made this deal with the English, they didn't consult the Huron. The Huron felt the deal was unfair. The story is a bit more complicated by this, but the Huron simply ignored the terms of the surrender and they attacked the retreating English soldiers and they killed many of them. Again, the story is a bit more complicated than this, but it does show three things. First, and obviously, it shows yet again the English losing badly. Second, it shows um, how the Indians sort of do their own thing in the French and Indian War, which being depicted in this picture is a little bit racist. You know, the Indians are savage and evil, and Montcalm is the voice of civilization, even though he's French, and the story is not quite this clear. But still, it does highlight the broad independence of action of the Indians in the French and Indian War. They kind of did whatever they want, whenever they wanted. And lastly, the Fort William Henry Massacre is the, the basis for the film that we're going to watch in a little bit called The Last of the Mohicans. The Last of the Mohicans hinges around the events leading up to, and of course, the event itself, um, the Fort William Henry Massacre. So anyway, the second broad point I wanted to make was that England loses badly at the start of this war. England's going to turn the corner in 1757. And, and it's really easy to explain why England starts to win this war. And it's ultimately because King George II is going to hire a new prime minister who is incredibly capable. He was a really smart guy. He was also really arrogant. He knew how smart he was. And that guy's name was William Pitt. William Pitt is going to essentially run the war effort for King George II. And I'll just sort of condense it down to its most reductive two points. The first thing that William Pitt does to turn 
the tide in this war, and there's King George II and the Prime Minister William Pitt, the first thing he's going to do is he's going to hire newer and younger generals. The two most famous of these are a guy named Jeffrey Amherst and this guy here, James Wolfe. James Wolfe is actually going to fight the most important battle in the French and Indian War. It's called the Battle of Quebec. And what he's going to do is he's going to um, have his men sail down the St. Lawrence River in Canada and scale these cliffs um, outside Quebec City. And they're going to fight this massive epic battle. Um, and James Wolfe is going to win. He's going to be killed in the battle itself. It's very dramatic. It's very tragic. Um, but when Quebec falls, uh, essentially, in 1759, this occurs. Essentially, France is going to have to um, abandon this war effort. The war is going to go on for some some more years after this, but for all intents and purposes, with the fall of Quebec um, comes essentially the, the unsustainability of France keeping up this war, at least in North America. But these younger generals like James Wolfe and um, Jeffrey Amherst are a little bit better able to adapt to the conditions of fighting in North America. And you can sort of see that in these guys um, scaling the walls right here. The second thing that William Pitt is going to do is not particularly elaborate. He's going to spend a lot of money. War, it turns out, is one of those things like baseball or, or professional soccer um, and and. In, in this sense, though I don't love sports and war metaphors, in this sense, it's it's a very apt metaphor. Um, in professional baseball and professional soccer, you typically get what you pay for. The more money you spend on your team, the more likely you are to make it to the World Series or win the Champions Cup. It's just that simple. There are always exceptions to this rule, but by and large, the teams that have the highest payrolls tend to do the best over the long haul. This is equally true, perhaps doubly true in war. Generally speaking, the size that spends more is usually the side that wins. There are exceptions to this rule and they're notable, but it's broadly a true point. And William Pitt is going to spend an incredible amount of money to hire mercenary soldiers and to bring more soldiers over to North America to ultimately win this war. And, and, and it works. Um, William Pitt, by the way, is going to be honored for being the architect of victory in this very important French and Indian War slash Seven Years War um, by having the city of Pittsburgh named after him. Fort Duquesne, which we know is the dominant French fort in Western Pennsylvania, had by the end of the war grown into more than just a, a a fort. It was a trading post that had turned into a town. And once the French are driven from the continent, something I'll talk about in a little bit, um, the English who now possess the, at least the, the eastern side of North America didn't want the French name for this town. So they changed it to Pittsburgh, obviously naming it honor of William Pitt, the architect of victory. Third point I want to talk about for you um, is the, the Treaty of Paris that's going to end the war for the British. Um, the Treaty of Paris is signed in 1763. It's confusing because a lot of important treaties in American history are called the Treaty of Paris, um, the treaty that ends the Revolutionary War in um, 1783 is called the Treaty of Paris. The treaty that ends the Spanish-American War in 1898 is called the Treaty of Paris. So you have to pay attention to the dates on this one, but the treaty that's going to end the war is is called the Treaty of Paris. It's called that because it's signed in Paris, France. Um, and it's just going to be an enormous victory for the English. I think this map says it all. So just take a moment and really look at this map. And what you can see in this map right here is this is what North America looks like prior to the French and Indian War. France possesses all of this land, or at least they say they do. They possess all of this land here, including this land up here in the eastern half of Canada. This is largely where New France is located. The British are sectioned off just into these 13 colonies ending up here in, in Maine and down here in Georgia. And the Spanish have Florida, and they have this section here of North America and virtually all of Central and South America, with the exception of Brazil. And you're going to see that that really dramatically changes. I mean, jump over to this. Here's North America after 1763. And you can see after 1763, North America has no France. Um, it's just the Spanish and the British. And you can see the British have expanded. The old western boundary of the British colonies was theoretically the Appalachian Mountains. If you're unfamiliar with what this is right here, it's a geographical marker. Um, that is the Mississippi River. So you can see how much land the British are going to gain. Um, according to the Treaty of Paris of 1763. It's a very, very big win um, for the, the English. And like I said, the French, by and large, are really chased from the colony. And that's what you can write down in your outline. For all intents and purposes, with the exception of a few colonies in the Caribbean, France is going to leave North America 
and North America now is really mostly going to be, at least the eastern half of North America, is mostly going to be a British thing. And our new western boundary is going to be the Mississippi River. Lastly, and this is perhaps the most important component of, of this lesson, um, England is really going to change its policy towards the colonies after the French and Indian War. Specifically, England is going to abandon its policy of salutary neglect. Now, we talked about salutary neglect a long time ago and among the very first classes that we took this year. So I would hope that you remember what salutary neglect is. Salutary is just a fancy word that means beneficial or good. Neglect obviously means ignoring something. So the beneficial ignoring is what salutary neglect meant. And basically, it was this kind of informal policy whereby the government of England, namely the king and Parliament left the English colonies alone in North America, so long as the English colonies did three things. Number one, they had to make money for them. Number two, they had to not cause any problems. And number three, they had to at least give nominal, nominal respect to the fact that England was the boss. And if you did those three things, pretend that England is the boss, continue to be profitable, don't cause any problems, you could do whatever you want. You could be a different religion. You could govern yourselves on day-to-day -day affairs your own way. You didn't have to do what the king said or what parliament said. You could kind of do your own thing. England is going to abandon that policy after the French and Indian War. And this is why the French and Indian War really is such an important moment in in American history because it's, it's really this abandonment of salutary neglect that's going to set in motion the chain of events that leads to the Revolutionary War. Had salutary neglect been in place, at some point in the future, it's more than likely that forces would have existed that caused America to break from England. But it would have happened a long ways down the road. And because they so quickly are going to abandon salutary neglect after the French and Indian War, you're going to see things are really going to ratchet up in the colonies. And you're going to get a very quick jump from the end of the French and Indian War, 1763, and the start of the Revolutionary War, 1775. That's 12 years. I know you guys are, are young, so 12 years seems almost like a lifetime to you. But in historic terms, 12 years is like the blink of an eye. So the question becomes, why does England abandon its policy of salutary neglect? It has to do with two things. Um, first, England is just kind of pissed at the colonies after the French and Indian War. They blame the colonies for starting this war. I, I'm not sure that that is entirely fair. I think forces existed that would have caused England and France to have a war anyway, but they're still going to look at what George Washington did when he marched out to Fort Duquesne and then killed Jumonville and then surrendered at Fort Necessity, and they're going to see that as the beginning of this massive war that England fights. Now that the war is over, they're going to turn to the colonies and say, you started this. Why did you start this? You didn't even consult us. And that's going to cause them to be angry. A second thing, and I didn't really talk about this that much in the fighting of the war, but the, the British are going to get this sense that the Americans, they didn't really think of them as Americans, the colonists, let's say, the colonists didn't really contribute much to the fighting of this war. Much of the fighting of the war, whether it was Braddock's men or Jeffrey Amherst's men or James Wolfe's men, were regulars who were shipped across from England, across the Atlantic to fight here. And that quite frankly, the colonists kind of sat back and didn't really contribute much to the war effort. George Washington is the exception here, but by and large, they're not wrong. The, the colonists didn't contribute um, that many men to fighting the French and Indian War. So let me see if I can kind of tighten this up a little bit because I'm rambling. You know, England is going to look at the colonies and they're going to say, rightly or wrongly, it doesn't matter. The truth doesn't matter. What matters is what people think is true. England is going to say, you guys started this war. And then you guys didn't really help us fight it all that much. And you benefited a lot from it. I mean, look at the expansion of territory that the British colonies get. They get all of this land now out all the way to the Mississippi River. This is the, the immediate beneficiaries of that is going to be um, are going to be the colonists themselves. But put those two things together. You start this war, you don't really contribute to fighting the war, but you gain immensely from the war itself. Now remember, salutary neglect is based on this idea that don't cause problems. Problems, and now you've caused problems. So, you know, if, if the, the quid pro quo is we'll give you sal salutary neglect, but you're, you have to be profitable and you can't cause problems, now you've caused problems, you're, you're breaking your end of the deal, so we are therefore justified in breaking our end of the deal. 
And the other thing, and, and I think this is really the big reason that England is going to abandon salutary neglect, um, is that England finds itself deep in debt after war. There is no action a government can take, none. I mean, there's no amount of palaces that you can build or expensive haircuts that you can get or jewelry or dresses that you can buy that will put a country in debt like fighting a war. It is the single most expensive thing a country can do. Remember that if you ever become in charge of a country. If, if you don't fight a war, you're going to save a lot of money. Just trust me on that. And William Pitt, I've already established, is going to win this war because he's going to outspend the other side. And in outspending the other side, he's going to find himself at the end of this war just holding a big bag of debt, if that makes any sense. There are very few ways governments can get out of debt. The most basic way a government can get out of debt is by taxing its people. And think about this. Now, first of all, you're all you're smart enough and you've been through this enough to know that the, the, it's taxes more than anything that are going to tweak the colonists and going to lead to the Revolutionary War. But it's deeper than that. If you want to collect taxes from people, aren't, if you just say, pay, pay me taxes, people aren't going to pay you taxes. Nobody wants to be separated from their money. You, you cannot just simply ask people to voluntarily give you tax money. The only way that you can get tax money from people is by creating a system of bureaucrats who go around and collect taxes from people. And that system includes accountants, accountants rather, it also includes um, like a police force, and it, it requires a huge amount of people. And that alone is contrary to salutary neglect. We can't leave the colonies alone if we're going to tax the colonies. We're going to have to bring this massive bureaucracy over, and part of that bureaucracy is going to be the military because, like I said, people don't willingly want to pay taxes. There has to be the threat of some punishment to do it. But William Pitt's got to get out of this debt right now. The only car that governments typically have to get out of debt is to increase taxes on their citizens, and William Pitt is going to have to do that. And that, acts of, that act of taxation is going to really set the ball in motion, not just to, to really put an exclamation point on the, the end of salutary neglect, but it's going to really get the ball rolling for the start of the Revolutionary War as well. And compounded with that is England is going to have a new king. Um, king George II is going to die before the French and the New War ends. His son, actually, Frederick, allegedly gets killed in this freak accident where he gets hit in the head with a tennis ball. I don't know if that's true or not, but um, that's the, the rumor. They get hit in the head with a tennis ball and died. And the throne is going to pass to his young grandson. And his young grandson is, is this guy, King George III. He's going to be the king during the Revolutionary War that we all hate, basically. Um, but King George III is going to come in, and he's going he's to make two basic mistakes. The first thing he's going to do is he's going to be very sort of insecure in his position. He's young, he's not proven, and he's going to be determined as so sometimes you'll see young people in leadership positions kind of like go out of their way to make sure people are treating me with respect. You know, you can't ignore me. You have to pay attention to me. And, and they're very thin skinned as a result. And, and King George III is clearly that. The other thing that he's going to do is he's going to feel insecure around William Pitt. He's going to see William Pitt as this guy who is smarter than him and everybody looks to when they walk into the room and not the king. And he's going to be offended by that. And he's going to fire William Pitt. And when he fires William Pitt, he probably fires the only guy who was capable of getting the colonists to pay taxes without a alienating them. Um, and the people that he's going to bring in, the prime ministers he's going to bring in after William Pitt are just a steady stream of idiots and mediocre men who are not really going to very effectively get the colonists on their side in this whole paying taxes thing. So that's the end of the lesson today. I just want you to be aware um, when you come to class next, we're going to have a class, excuse me, a quiz on the French and Indian War. It's going to be on primarily this PowerPoint on the fighting of the French and Indian War. Um, we're going to start class with a Kahoot to kind of reinforce these points, but you guys are going to take this quiz in class. Okay, have a good day and I'll see you soon.